If you're turning in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18, that's where we'll start out. Deuteronomy chapter 18, we'll read from a number of different passages before we get started into the message. Deuteronomy chapter 18, we'll begin reading at verse 10. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord." And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them, wow, doth drive them out from before thee. You'll notice in verse 12 there, he says, for all that do these things are an abomination, now wait, that's not the end of it, unto the Lord. Has he changed? Tell you what, in a lot of Christian homes today, we seem to think he's changed. I mean, after all, there are several things that he said were an abomination to the Lord in this book alone, the book of Deuteronomy, that nobody in most of the churches calls an abomination anymore. They've explained them away. Times have changed. Culture is different. Yeah, but God's not. God's not. Culture, unfortunately, has become the God for compromise. And people are much more willing to follow the God of compromise than the God who is holy, who does not change. Now, I'm talking about a number of areas. I'm not just talking about witchcraft. Does God feel the same way about witchcraft today that he did when he wrote this? He does, doesn't he? It's important for us to understand that. Listen, God's not concerned about how you feel about it. God didn't take up a vote and doesn't take up an annual vote to decide what's going to be wrong this year and what are we changing for this next year. God doesn't do that. He doesn't operate like that. He never has operated like that. All right, let's go over to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. While we were singing the songs, I was thinking of a passage that I had not put into my message, and I'm hoping I don't forget it for the end of the message that I think is pretty powerful. Notice in chapter 5, he says in verse 9, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Let me stop right there. He says, and have no fellowship. What do you think that means? Do you think no fellowship means some fellowship? No, no fellowship means no fellowship, period, with the unfruitful works of darkness. He says, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done to them in secret. But all things are reproved, are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. And actually what I'm trying to do tonight is to wake some people up and wake some homes up as to the danger to their own children as well as to themselves about things that they don't think are that big of a deal, even though God calls them an abomination. Now, I mentioned I was going to be preaching on the latest superheroes of Marvel, the Marvel Comic Year, let's see, what say, the Marvel Comic Universe. They have created their own universe, by the way. There are a number of articles on the internet about that. Now, I would not have known that had it not been brought to my attention. And Brother Cloud, by the way, wrote about it a couple of weeks ago in the Friday news notes that, that he has. Interesting reading. That can help keep you up on some things. Uh, I'll tell you what, and after doing the study 
that I've done to prepare for this message. Weeding out a lot of stuff because there's absolutely no time to cover all the stuff that has to do with the Marvel Comic Universe. I want you to understand we're not just talking about Marvel Comics. And we're going to be dealing with them, but the DC Comics are every bit as full of the same type of stuff, along with immodesty and immorality and filth, as the Marvel Comic Universe. They all go together. This is not George Reeves playing Superman. This is totally different. It's not what it used to be. It's kind of like Disney. Disney is not what it was when we were kids. But they're getting by on what their, for lack of a better word, what their testimony was back then. They're getting by on that. It was all innocent, and they were little cartoons. Well, guess what? A lot of this is still cartoons, but there's nothing innocent about any of it. Now, there's no doubt that our nation is full of sins, and all of the very sins for which God drove the Canaanites out of the land of, of uh, Canaan, this country is full of. As a matter of fact, this country is full of the very same sins that you would find in Genesis chapter 6 when God destroyed the world because of its wickedness. One of the things, I believe the Tower of Babel has been built, but it's an electronic Tower of Babel. It's called the Internet. To where we think we can reach up to God so that if God tries to flood us out again, he can't do it. We've got God beat. No, God's still the one who wins. Whether you like it or not, you can deny it all you want and say, I'm going to raise my fist to God. Just read Psalm 2 because it's all for you, if that's what you're thinking. Not only did Israel partake of their sins, but even gave their children over to it later on. These things were strongly, of course, condemned by God. But can we make them right by putting them in a computer game? Can we make them right by making them a cartoon instead of having real people do it? Of course, now they've got real people doing movies and shows and uh, TV shows and all, all those type of things and demonstrating a lot of the same stuff that is in their comic books. They have come up with an entire universe of wickedness and witchcraft, literally. Now, in Romans chapter 1, by the way, you say, well, I don't participate in that, but I enjoy watching it. Well, just a moment. Turn over to Romans chapter 1. I'm going to read some stuff to you in just a little bit. I'll tell you, I felt like I needed to take a shower every five minutes that I was in this stuff. Just reading about it. This is shocking. I want you to notice, now let's go to verse 18. It's a familiar verse. We've used it many times. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. Now you go to verse 29. He says, and being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God. He doesn't say haters of God's. Matter of fact, the devil would love to get you to worship all kinds of gods. He says, haters of God. And the reality is, whereas people are willing to swallow all the gods of the Marvel Comic Universe, and there are many gods in the Marvel Comic Universe, as well as their demons and their helpers and all of that kind of stuff that goes on. It is amazing how many people hate it when we attack those gods And hate us when we stand up for God. The truth is, the gods of the Marvel comic universe are every bit as corrupt only with superpowers. As is the devil himself. And yet, young people, church young people are paying for them. Well, let me go on here. He mentions all those things. But I want you to notice verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God which they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. What's really sad is when you've got God's people having pleasure in those that are doing the very things 
that God condemns. Marvel has taken a new turn. Some of you may remember back in the 1960s when the Marvel comic books came along and they had heroes in them like Iron Man, Spider-Man, the Hulk, Captain America. Now they were people who received their special powers because of some scientific accident. For instance, remember the Spider-Man was bitten by a radioactive spider. And as a result, he got his spider tendencies from a mistake in science that had taken place. You got the Hulk. He became exposed to gamma rays. It wasn't witchcraft. He had the change that took place when he got real angry, which probably, I think, was a good metaphor to an awful lot of husbands in the homes when they get angry. But that happened all because he was exposed to gamma rays. Uh, You had Iron Man. Iron Man, Tony Stark, by the way, Iron Man was simply a really smart manufacturer before he became a missionary to Eastern Africa. <laughs> but there was nothing magical about it. There was nothing witchcraft about it. It was simply, simply the ingenuity of a mind that could do some very super things. Now, if you weren't around in the 60s and 70s and didn't see those comic books, you may have think that Marvel is doing what it's always done. No, it's not doing what it's always done. It's gone way beyond that. So, it kind of reminds me that yesterday, I, I have my radio. I have one station that it, my radio was set on. And uh, my car radio, and that's the only time I ever listen to radio, and I don't listen to it much because I do listen to audio books most of the time. But when the radio comes on, it comes on to old-time radio. And it's uh, it's a serious station. It's the only one that I listen to when I I listen to the radio. And uh, they do the old-time radio shows. They do the Lone Ranger, Have Gun, Will Travel, uh, you know, um, all those old shows that are like that. Well, they were doing one yesterday, and I only got the introduction. I thought, this is interesting. It was the green... uh, Hornet, the Green Hornet. Do you know what the Green... Now, the Green Hornet was an editor of a newspaper. And, of course, Bruce Lee was his sidekick back before anybody knew who Bruce Lee even was. And here they were. Now, Bruce Lee was not his sidekick in the radio program. That came along later on. But in the beginning of the program, before they ever got into the action or the story, it announced the Green Hornet who sought out the enemies of America to keep them from harming the nation. And I thought, boy, if that was still true, he'd have to buy a residence in Washington, D.C. and would never be able to leave the city. There would be so much to do. Enemies of America who swore to defend the Constitution of the United States while they have spent all their time doing what they could to destroy it. Now, that was just my political statement for the day, and uh, see what kind of trouble that gets me. Anyway, the thing that shocked me was when I found out that even Madison Baptist Church has numbers of Christian young people who are in to the Marvel comic uh, universe. Just like it shocked me when I found out that there were actually parents who called themselves Christians who fed their children the Harry Potter stuff and would read it to them. Harry Potter was about nothing but witchcraft. It was totally the occult. You understand, in God's universe, there is no white witchcraft. It's all wicked witchcraft. Every bit of it. I was alarmed when I found out that a lot of our teenage girls, as well as several moms, were into the Twilight vampire books. I mean, I couldn't couldn't believe it. You wonder, why is there no power with God? Because we're honoring Satan in our homes. This is absolutely shocking. We're feeding that kind of filth and garbage to the children in homes where they ought to be protected from that kind of thing. And they're not being protected. They're being fed it. 
And then we wonder why they have trouble coming up with Christian values. Why the Bible is a foreign book to them. They have trouble naming the 12 apostles, but they can name the gods of the Marvic comic universe. They've got them down. Man, this is sad. What's going on? Now, as far as the Marvel comics move into the occult, a subject that David Cloud wrote on, as I said, a couple of weeks ago. Let me get, just give you a couple of things that he mentioned about it. He called it, he called, it talked about a fictional book called Darkhold, also known as the Book of Sins, is the focus of a Marvel comic book series, the Marvel television series Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Runaway, or Runways, and the live-action miniseries WandaVision 2021. The author of Darkhold is supposed to be, and I don't know how you pronounce this, it's C-H-T-H-O-N. Don't yell it out. I don't want you to be embarrassed. Cathan, or whatever it is, is a demonic elder god who was Earth's, Earth's first practitioner of black magic. I saw one picture, and they have many pictures because they've drawn up all kinds of them, where this supposed god is talking, and he says he's been known by different names throughout the centuries. And it mentions some of the different false gods. And then he says another name was Yahweh. Now that ought to make you burn everything marble that you've got just right there. I mean, how blasphemous can you possibly get? How could any Christian hope to defend this kind of ungodliness and blasphemy? Well, pages of Darkhold are said to be scattered across the earth and can summon massive dark powers. Darkhold mythology is filled with wizards and sorcerers, incantations, spellcasting, curses, demons, vampires, werewolves, zombies, necromancy, superpowers, magic healing, astral projection, and teleporting, dimensional travel, high evolution deceit, Theft, torture, murder, not to speak of nakedness. One, one character even sacrifices her soul to Kithon, or however you say it. Another popular Marvel comic occult character is Scarlet Witch, appearing in Marvel comic books since, believe it or not, 1964. She was never very popular, evidently, until these later days. Her superhuman traits are a product of magic and scientific experimentation. She's a member of the Avengers superhero team. By magic, she impregnated herself and bore twin sons. Now think about that for a second. Are you getting what that's saying? Well, let me get back to it here. Her twin sons are named Wiccan and Speed. Between 2015 and 2017, Scarlet Witch was featured in her own comic series. She also appears in Marvel animated films, television series, arcade and video games, including Captain America. She is the main character in WandaVision and is scheduled to appear in the forthcoming Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. That's in 2022. Now, there was also an article by a person who was simply, a non-Christian person who was simply reviewing what was going on in the Marvel comic universe. He says this about WandaVision. WandaVision fundamentally changed Marvel magic, planted the seeds for new super teams, altered the trajectory of S.W.O.R.D., and possibly revealed the main theme of Phase 4, but mostly WandaVision changed the, the MCU, that's the Marvel Comic Universe, forever. First up, let's talk about WandaVision. Open the door to the spooky side of the Marvel Universe by introducing all manner of supernatural elements. Doctor Strange may have been our first true MCU magic user, but his magic was described as the energy of the multiverse 
being manipulated into spells rather than anything occult or supernatural like we're used to seeing in Marvel Comics. The source material is filled with all sorts of magic, uh, magic relics and magic monsters, and now WandaVision is signaling that Marvel Studios is ready to unleash them on the MCU the same way Guardians of the Galaxy ease fans in the, into the cosmic side of things. Now, they said when Wanda Maximoff, I'm probably not going to pronounce some of these right, but hopefully most of you don't know how to pronounce them right anyway. When Wanda Maximoff was introduced as the MCU to the MCU in Avengers, Age of Ultron, she was more like goth Jean Grey, whoever that is, with the pretty standard powers of telepathy and telekinesis. But in WandaVision, thanks to a little help from centuries-old witch Agatha Harkness, she became the Scarlet Witch proper, complete with red chaos magic and matching cape and headpiece look, finally aligning Wanda with her comic book counterpart. Agatha was Wanda's mentor in the comics, so it's fitting that she was the one to teach Wanda her first hard lessons about magic in the MCU. In fact, everything about Agatha seems to indicate the MCU is going to become a much creepier place going forward. Between the animal skulls, glowing runes, the statue of Baphomet in Agatha's basement, we now know that satanic rituals and demonic magic now exist in the MCU. What we would call eldritch magic. This opens the door for all manner of spellcasting Marvel characters to finally make their debut. Now, you understand, if, what's mind-boggling, if you look at the material on this put out by Mar Marvel or at least their fans, I mean, they've got so many different characters all lined up with so many different superpowers that are done by magic. And you talk about principalities and powers, they have exploded onto the Marvel comic book scene. So that you really can't tell which ones are good and which ones are evil. They're kind of like the WWE. The good guy this week may become the bad guy next week. And, of course, the only difference between them and the WWE is they don't have magical superpowers in the WWE. A lot of strangeness goes on, but that's another matter. goes on to say there are heroes like Brother Voodoo. Man Thing, Dr. Druid, Captain Britain, and Magic. Then there are the villains like Enchantress, Mephisto, Morgan Le Fay, Dr. Doom, and Cthon. Cthon was one of innumerable elder gods who ruled over the earth billions of years ago. Among the elder gods, he was considered one of the greatest and dedicated centuries to gathering and researching magic in all its forms. Now, I'm thinking about this for a second. If this Cthon was a god, I mean God, gods are omnipotent. They're omnipresent. They, they not only, they, they know everything. Gods, he didn't, he had to learn it. Well, I wonder who wrote the books to teach him. And he must have been a slow student because he had to learn it over centuries. Do you realize our God has always known everything? Amen. Always. He didn't have to learn from anybody. He's God. When he created the heavens and the earth, he didn't follow some, some God's architectural drawings from the past. He created it by his own word. That's our God. What a difference. Well, anyway, let me go on about him. Among the elder gods, he was considered one of the greatest dedicated centuries to gathering this information. After about a million or so years, the elder gods degenerated into demons. So those gods went backwards and warred with one another. This caused Gaia to form the demigorge to destroy the elder gods and to allow life on earth to survive. The demigorge proceeded to devour all the elder gods, save those who managed to flee off-world. Unsurprisingly, the clever and scheming Cthon was among the elder gods who managed to escape the demigorge. 
but became extra dimensional in the process, unable to fully influence Earth any longer. And I would say he's still influencing Earth. Just a thought. Yet Kathan, true to his nature, left behind his arcane scrolls on indestructible parchment. Just think about that for a second. And I'd like to know how he tore the pages out of the book. If it's indestructible parchment. You know, I believe that this is a setup, and there is a conspiracy going on about this, and the devil is the one who has done it. The conspiracy about this is to leave young people's minds totally away from truth to a virtual world of absolute wickedness where really anything goes. No wonder so many young people cannot think rationally even about 2 plus 2 equals 4. I mean, we have classes where if a good number of people in the class say 2 plus 2 is 5, then everybody's got, got to go along with them. No wonder they don't have the ability to think. So Kathan, true to his nature, left behind the arcane scrolls on indestructible parchments on earth as a means to obtain a link to the realm these scrolls would eventually be gathered and become the infamous dark hole. Now, you've got, in some of these magical, mystical gods of the Marvel comic world, you've got some that can change their genders at will. Oh, that sounds like today too, doesn't it? We have people that do that today. We have guys that believe they're girls whenever there's a sporting event. But they get over it when the sporting event's over. And there are people out there who absolutely cannot think, somehow think, hey, yeah, that's good. That's nutty. Then, and I'm not, <laughs> listen, because some of these pictures were in the articles on this that they draw, there is nothing modest about the way the male or the females are dressed in any of the comic book pictures. Comic book. Remember when comic books were comic. These are not comic. They are dark. They are wicked. They are ungodly. And to push witchcraft in light of what God says in his word. So number one, let's ask some questions. That's all introduction. And believe me, I left out a lot. If I, I'd like to know who sat down and came up with all this stuff. It's absolutely amazing. And they're making multiplied millions on it. I, I don't know, I was so simple growing up. You, you know, we get up in the morning, we go out and play baseball. In football season, we played football. Go hunting with dad or go fishing with dad. And it, we, didn't, we didn't fill our heads with all kinds of nonsense like that. And we were blessed. We didn't have the computer games. We didn't have cell phones. We had a little black and white TV set that got three channels. That we could return to that. We might, we might save some people from absolutely going nutty. But what should the Christian response be? Well... Let's go back to a couple of verses. First of all, go over to the Ephesians passage again. Ephesians chapter 5. In verse 11 he says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. May I say, witchcraft is darkness. It's not light. It's wicked. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Speak out against them. Talk about how wrong and how wicked they are. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. You see, when we preach on those things, it exposes them for what they are. 
We have a responsibility to take a stand. Singles, you have a responsibility to take a stand among other singles. Singles that are wrapped up in this, you have a responsibility to take a stand. Don't let them get away with just filling your head with all this kind of garbage. Tell you what they're doing like it's some good thing. This is something they ought to be ashamed of. And let me tell you why they're not ashamed. They're not ashamed because nobody among their peers will take a stand. That's why they're not ashamed. They're not reproved. Go back to the passage in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Now, let's just notice the passage again. Beginning in verse 9, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among them, or among you, anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, for all that do these things are, now I want you to notice that, for all that do these things. He's talking about the people. All that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. This is important. God was giving them a land. But there were certain things he didn't want going on in the land that he was giving them. Just as God drove out the Canaanites for all these things being in the land, if Israel would begin to do those things in the land, then God would drive them out of the land Shades of the book of Judges, and then onward when they get taken over by the Syrians, and then later get taken over by the, uh, by the Babylonians. God took them out of the land. He didn't give them the land to do whatever they wanted to do. He gave them the land to worship Him. And He told them, these things shouldn't be done. Go over to the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 24. The, through Joshua 23 and the first part of Joshua 24, God or Joshua reviews with the people how he had brought them into the land and how he had given them the land. Joshua is getting ready to say his final words. And he says in verse 13, And I have given you a land for which he did not labor and cities which he built not, and ye dwell in them, of the vineyards and olive yards, which ye planted not, do ye eat. Now therefore, fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, that were on the other side of the flood are the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. That's an amazing answer. He told them, put away your false gods, that's first, then serve the Lord. They said, we will serve the Lord. So they talk a little bit, and then it says in verse 19, and Joshua said unto the people, ye cannot serve the Lord. Why? He didn't hear what he needed to hear. He needed to hear they were going to put away their false gods. They didn't say they'd put away their false gods. They just said they would serve the Lord. There are people who think they can serve the Lord and be involved in the DC and Marvel comic mess, all that witchcraft and stuff that's going on in there. You can't serve the Lord. See, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. He says, sanctify yourselves. That's what the scripture says. Now wait. It says, for he says in verse 20, 
Oh, well, let me read that whole verse, verses 19 to 20. And Joshua said unto the people, you cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt and consume you after that he had done you good. Now notice the people respond again, second time. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. What are they missing? Yeah, they're not going to put away their false gods. No, I like this. It's good to me. Therefore, we're going to keep doing it. But I'll do it, and I'll tell you what, I'll serve the Lord. It doesn't work like that. So notice how he responds. Joshua said unto the people, Ye are witnesses against yourselves. That you notice, ye are witnesses against yourselves. That ye have chosen you, the Lord, to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. All right, so here we go. Third, third, third try. He says, Now therefore, put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. Now it sounds really spiritual to say they'll serve the Lord, but how is that going to happen when they never said they'd put away their false gods? So what's the result of that? Go over to Judges chapter 2. Notice in the middle of verse 1, he says, I made you to go up out of Egypt, and I have brought you unto the land which I swear unto your fathers, and I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and ye shall make no league with the inhabitants of the land. Ye shall throw down their altars, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Wherefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. And it came to pass when the angel of the Lord spake these words unto all the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voice and wept. And they called the name of that place Bochim and they sacrificed there unto the Lord. So they're going about all the things that they were supposed to do, didn't do the main thing they had to do first, which was to put away their false gods. As a result, a little later on, beginning in about verse 14, well, verse 13, and they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. Why? They never got rid of them. Never got them out of the land. It says, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. He delivered them into the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them. Who delivered them into the hand of the spoilers? God did. Now, there's a false doctrine out there today that the God of the New Testament is different than the God of the Old Testament. He's exactly the same. He hasn't changed one bit. There is no difference. He still hates sin. He is still a jealous God. And you understand that when God deals with his people, he doesn't do it with a little, oh, and I'm sorry to bother you. I know there are things that you want to do, and I understand that, and I'll try to make it up to you if you would just think about giving it up, but... You know I'm a loving and gracious and forgiving God, so it'll be okay even if you don't. That's not God. It's not the God of the New Testament or the Old Testament, either one. And as a result, with the anger of the Lord kindled against them, verse 15 says, Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord has sworn unto them. And they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord raised them up judges. Now, that is... What took place throughout the 400 years of the book of Judges? They would do that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And almost always it had to do with the false gods. You think, how many times does God have to repeat this pattern with them until they would finally get it? They never got it. They never got it. And guess what? God's people who got a complete Bible... In Bible-believing churches still don't get it. You talk about without excuse. At least the people in Joshua's day only had the first five books of the Bible. And they didn't get it. We've got all 66 books of the Bible. We don't get it. 
And people want to think that somehow God's going to do away with the promises to Israel and give it to the church when the church still doesn't get it. We're not any different than, than the Israelites before as far as standing upon God's word. Now, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And you remember since we just went through 1 Corinthians about eating meat offered in sacrifice to idols, they had, up, had come up with a cute explanation as to why it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't a big deal because there is only one God. Therefore, meats that are offered to sacrifice to idols, since an idol is really no God at all, therefore they're really sacrificed to nothing, therefore it's all right to go ahead and eat the meat offered in sacrifice to idols. Now, notice in verse, oh, let's see, verse 16. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The blood which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread, one body, and we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel after the flesh are not they which eat of the sacrifice, our sacrifices, partakers of the altar. What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. Dungeons and dragons. I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. Ouija board. I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. The Marvel Comic Universe, I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. Not, you can't get any straighter than that. Now notice what he says. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Do you get what this is? The things here were the same as idolatry and witchcraft, and all of that, and whether it's playing these games, reading these comic books, or whatever, you are not only having fellowship with them, you are participating, you are supporting it, you're doing all of that. Somebody said, I know who it was, it was Alexander Pope, in his essays on man, sin is a monster of such frightful means as to be hated but be seen. Yet seen too oft, familiar with her face, is first endured and then pitied and then embraced. I'm going to tell you. Now, you, what, I, what I saw this week in the preparation of this message disgusted me. The blasphemy disgusted me. But, you know, if I kept looking at it after a while, it wouldn't disgust me so much anymore. Our young people, by the way, who should be learning about God and godly things in the home, learning things about, for the men, what makes a man? What are men expected to do? What kind of responsibilities are they expected to have? And the young ladies are taught to be godly, are supposed to be taught to be godly, and yet we have given them over to this stuff because it sure does keep the kids out of our hair. We don't want to know what they're playing on, TV, on uh, the computer. We don't want to know what they're learning from the Marvel comic universe because, after all, it gives me time to do other things. I don't have to watch them. But raising children is more than just providing food on the table. We are commanded to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now, he did that, said basically the same thing to Israel back in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Turn back there. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Beginning in verse 4, it is the passage that Jesus referred to when he was asked the question in Matthew chapter 22, what's the great commandment? Notice in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 4, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. 
And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. And shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way. And when thou liest down and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand. And they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on the gates. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which I swear, which he swear unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest, and houses full of good things. Notice verse 12. Then beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him, and shalt swear... By his name, ye shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you. Lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. Notice his next statement. Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as ye tempted him in Massa. In Judges chapter 6. Israel was in bondage to the Midianites. They were so in bondage to the Midianites, they had taken away all the weapons the Midianites had that the Israelites had. They were Democrats. It's all right. They had taken it because if they had weapons, they could overthrow them. You know, that was the problem. Now... The land was impoverished. And here is Gideon. God sends an angel to call Gideon to be the champion to deliver Israel. But the first thing that he was supposed to do is to go to his father's house. Because his father had a statue or an idol to Baal. And he was to destroy the Uh, the altar to Baal and destroy that idol of Baal and destroy the groves of the trees. Now, so he goes up there at night. He didn't do it during the day. He was still a little cowardly yet. Even though he's called a mighty man of valor, it takes him a while to stand up before people and take a strong stand. And so he goes up and he destroys the altar to Baal. When it comes known that that altar at his father's house had been destroyed, The men of the city are absolutely livid. They come up and they are demanding that Gideon's father give him over to them so that they can put him to death. His father shouldn't have had that altar to Baal. That had been condemned by God a long time before. It didn't take these people long to change their saying, I will serve the Lord till we will protect Baal. That's where they're at. But all this stuff is so much fun. Listen, get into reality. Get in. I I don't care what's fun. You can make all kinds of wickedness fun, but fun doesn't make it right. That's not the standard criteria that is needed for it to be right, obedience to God's word. If we've got to turn to witchcraft, drugs, and dope, and immorality, a la spring vacation, you know, it's got to be driving liberals crazy because they've come up with a virus of trying to get everybody to stay home and it's taken away their fun at spring vacation. Like somehow fun makes it all right. There's nothing right about it at all. It's just ungodliness. I can't imagine any Christian parent allowing one of their children to go to a place like that and paying for it. But all over this country, there are parents who do that very thing. What's sad is some of them belong to what they would call Bible-believing churches. What are we going to do? We say, oh, we need the blessings of God. We need the power of God. Oh, and we do need that. We need his power today. But you know what? As Joshua told 
the children of Israel, you cannot serve the Lord. You are witnesses against yourself. Until there is real repentance on the part of God's people to get this kind of wickedness out of their lives and out of their homes, then we're just going to continue to be religious but not real. To get real, we have to get clean. He said of Jesus Christ, God the Father said of Jesus Christ, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, thy God hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. We need to get back to where we hate iniquity and decide that we are not going to turn our children over to it. We're not going to be passive on that. We're getting those false gods totally out of our homes and out of our lives. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Dear God, do your work. Lord, I, I don't know how to cover this any clearer without spending the next four hours just going over the wickedness and we'd be so caught up in all of that. We still wouldn't consider it how you do. So, Lord, deal with our hearts tonight. May there be a repentance on the part of your people who have had any part of this at all in their lives, whether it be Marvel or DC or any of those other things that are out there today. God, please, do a work in our lives and cleanse us, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name.